The number five is the number of humanity. Did you know that? Number of humanity. If you think about it, we have uh, five main uh, systems in our body, okay? Five appendages, all right, including your head. Uh, we have five fingers, five toes, right? Some of you do, most of you do. Uh, five major systems of the body. Uh, there are five great mysteries, creation, uh, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, redemption. There are five senses, right? What are our five senses? Touch, hearing, seeing, smell, taste, all that good stuff, right? Five senses. And I was just thinking to myself how powerful it is that God does things in five. And we're here celebrating our five-year anniversary. And in a moment, I want to tell you what that number five means according to the scriptures. But I was thinking, what is my favorite sense? Like, what's the sense I could not live without? If, if, if somebody asked you, you had to go uh, without four of your senses, uh, what's one that you had to have? And I'm just thinking to myself, like, I love my son. I love hearing him say, Daddy, when I walk in the door, I want to watch him pummel people in football one day. Okay, I want to hear, I want to see all this. I love, to, I love to hug him. But I'm just telling you right now, I, I can't live without taste. I'm a husky kid. Okay, like, like I, I, can, I can know what happens. You can communicate with me, but like I need to eat chicken wings and pizza and cheesesteaks when I'm experiencing a football game. You know what I'm saying? Like, like any, any husky people in the house, you know what I'm saying? Like you can't live without your taste. Why don't you look at somebody next to you and just ask them, what could you not live without? What's, what's the sense? Ask them. What's the one sense? You know what's cool about our body? What's cool about our body? I don't need any, I don't need any mic in my monitors, just so you know, you can kill it all from here. Uh, but what's cool about our body is, is, is that when you are without a sense, your other senses, right, they, they work harder. And so like if you are blind, you actually get better at hearing. Did you know that? Isn't that awesome? You know, the, the, the number five is the number of grace in the scriptures. Number of grace. Guys, please take my mic out of the monitors. God bless you. I love you. I love all of them. Love you. <laughs> the number five is the number of God's grace. And what's powerful about this is, is that God would take his majesty, his glory, his splendor, and he would partner with our humanity. What I mean by that is, 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 have you had something in your body not work well? Anybody? Maybe your eyes, maybe you lost sight, maybe your ears, maybe you touched, something's happened, you've gone through something. And I love the fact that God provides five as an offering of grace, that in his goodness, he partners his goodness with our mess, with our frailty, and it's his majesty making something beautiful in, his, in our humanity. But what do I mean by that? Let me, let me take that further. God is attracted to things that are broken. God is attracted to things that aren't quite right. God is attracted to missing toes, missing hands, missing pieces of your heart, missing pieces of your mind, of your soul. God is attracted to messes. How could that be? Because he's the God of majesty. When you think of majesty, you're thinking like Disney World, right? Like you're thinking like glory and, and splendor. You're thinking kings and kingdoms. You're thinking of when you wept and cried when the Eagles won the Super Bowl. Like that's majestic. And like something that good and something that glorious, why is it willing, something that, that incredible, why is it willing to partner with my, my frailty? Like I am not perfect, yet I get to experience a perfect God. His majesty consumes my humanity. I'm like, that's where I want to go today. I want to preach a message today titled our title track called Humanity Majesty because here's what I believe. I believe that our humanity reveals his majesty and his majesty redeems our humanity. It reveals it and it redeems it, redeems it. Now I wanna to go to a story today and I wanna teach you and show you how his majesty partners with our humanity. John chapter 11, the context here before I read is that uh, Jesus has some friends, Martha, Mary, Lazarus, and they're sick. Excuse me. Lazarus is sick, and they send word to Jesus, and they're a little bit frantic. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you're worried and you're frantic, and you're yelling at Jesus to help you? Anybody been there? 
Do you remember, like, I was driving to church today, and I had to deal with my husband again, and I was yelling at Jesus, please help this man. <laughs> right? He's sick. I'm not. I'm going to Jesus. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. Now, I find that fascinating because there was no death mentioned. Lazarus was just sick. But I think it's interesting, powerful, important, and you need to note that Jesus knows what you're going through. He knows what's going to happen, and he knows what you're afraid about. Jesus knows your thoughts. He is omniscient. That, that means that he is all-knowing. He is in the details of your life, and what you're afraid of and what you're afraid about today, God knows about it. And what you're thinking about and you're wondering what my future is going to be like, what my purpose is going to be like, where am I going, what's happening? God knows what you're afraid of and he's speaking to it. It's why you're in this room. And Jesus goes on and says, but on the contrary, it is for the glory and honor of God so that the Son of Man might be glorified through this sickness. And this is a challenging piece of scripture to teach to you today because essentially Jesus is saying sometimes bad things happen and it's for your good. Uh, sometimes bad stuff, trials are going to happen and it's for your good. But take heart because Jesus loved and was concerned about Martha and her sister and Lazarus and in brackets considered them dear friends. So, so I want you to understand something today that just because you're going through a trial, just because you're going through a struggle, just because you have shame or something's broken in your life, it doesn't mean that God doesn't care about you, love you, or consider you a dear friend. But here's how God reveals his majesty through our senses, but he reveals his majesty through trials. And if you've gone through a trial or if you are going through a trial, good news, Jesus is on the way to show you his love. That's the good news. See, that line, the trial is for the glory of God, this is displayed all throughout Scripture. I mean, if you think about Joseph, who's arrested and then becomes governor, but he had to go through some stuff to get where God wanted him. I mean, Naomi, she loses her sons. She loses her husband, right? People all throughout Scripture. You look through the Scriptures. Paul went through stuff. Job went through stuff. The theme in Scripture is that you got to pay a price for the blessing that God wants to give you. Just part of it. Well, why? Because we identify, we have to experience that his majesty came down and became humanity so that we might walk with him and know him. And so trials, though they're challenging, they do not mean that God's not with you. In fact, the appearance of a trial does not mean a disappearance of God's love. So here's what God will do. See, some of us, we've got it all together. And we don't actually think that we're in a trial, but we're actually in the trial of our life. We've got the cars, we've got the stuff, we've got the relationship, we've got the money, we've got the house, we've got everything we prayed for and looked for and ran for. We've got it all, but we lay awake at night in our bed crying, going, something's missing. I mean, we, we have everything. We've tried everything. And still in the back of our mind, we're going, I can't really satisfy myself. Something's not right here. And what happens is, is God will allow trials. He will allow brokenness. He will allow you to cry and lay awake at night. He'll allow the breakup to happen. God will allow some stuff in your life, even dad not being there as you grew up and have daddy issues and all these different things. Though that's challenging, he might allow it because God wants to impart his love. And the only way he could get there is if there was a trial. And you've been mad at God and wondering, God, why or how? And you've not been able to move forward in your faith because you thought the trial was a punishment. But the trial was not a punishment. It was actually an opportunity to, for God to open you up and say, I've got a testimony for your life. <laughs> now, Pastor Grace, our Port Richmond location pastor, she's here, and so is her mom, Brenda. And uh, Brenda, Brenda in the back waving, wanted to make sure she didn't miss her moment here, you know. And uh, Brenda, um, she uh, has been in a fight for her life, breast cancer, for the last three years. And we've been praying. I mean, our church has been praying. And uh, she's gone through six rounds of chemo or six surgeries, multiple rounds of chemo. I mean, it's been a lot. It's taken a toll on her life, her body, all of it. If you know somebody who's been through cancer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and, and so, so, but through all of this, she's made this statement, I think it's powerful, that this has been the pain 
and the trial of my life, but it's also been the joy of my life. How does somebody say that? Is it possible that God might do something even more significant in your trial than he could if you were just walking through life? And so here's this woman who's now ministered to many of people. So much good has happened and taken place through this circumstance. And her family is closer than ever. Her children are serving God. I bet you there's some people in here that would take some sickness to see your family come together. And I'm not saying it always has to happen like that, but sometimes God uses trials to get our attention. And what you need to know is that God's love is not predicated on what God allows. If you don't get that in your soul today, you might walk away from experience and say God is evil and he's hurtful. But it's possible that God was simply trying to show you that you could have love and that you could be more whole in a hospital bed than walking around trying to prove something to yourself and other people. God shows up in trials and in 2 Corinthians, he says, I'll praise Paul says, I'll praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone who's going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. Maybe your trial is for somebody else. Maybe your trouble is for somebody else. Maybe God trusted you enough with some pain that he wanted to give you a platform to use it to reach somebody else. We have plenty of hard times, the scripture says, that come from following the Messiah, but no, no more so than the good times of his healing comfort. We get a full measure of that too. Has anybody experienced that in their soul? Jesus, listen to this, Jesus uses the pain of our humanity to reveal the purpose of his majesty. There are so many instances and scenarios and circumstances where there have been people who have had excruciating pain and out of the ashes comes something powerful. Out of the ashes comes a nonprofit. Out of the ashes comes a business. Out of the ashes comes an idea. Out of the ashes comes love and life and hope. And what I would say to you today that just because you feel a little sick or just because you're going through a little something or just because somebody wasn't there or just because somebody left, it doesn't mean it's over. It just means it's a trial. And God reveals his goodness in our trials. Because we're human, because this life is short, because this moment is fading and it's fleeting. And what are we going to do with the trial we have? And we have to reframe our mind. Not, 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 oh, I can't wait for this to end, but rather, God, what would you like me to do as you trust me with this trouble? If we had that perspective, then we might welcome these opportunities to see God be glorified through our life. And that is how his majesty partners with our humanity. The Bible says, so even when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed in the same place two more days. Now, that scripture bothers me. Because, like, Jesus, like, bro, like, he's sick, and, like, you're the healer. So I'm here. Where are you at? Anybody been there? We're like, hey, God, uh, hey, uh, hello, I I'm doing it all right. I'm singing, victory is yours. And I'm singing it on key, and I'm doing it right. And I ain't got no victory. You been there? Yeah. Or like, you're like, you're like, oh, why is everybody else getting their breakthrough? Why is everybody else getting their baby? Why is everybody else uh, getting in a relationship? Why is everybody else getting the raise? Why is everybody else getting the... And you're watching everybody else getting take care of, and you're going, God, where are you at? I'm out here faithful. I don't even hold hands anymore. I'm so faithful. I'm frustrated with that scripture. Guess what? It's okay to be frustrated sometimes at some things. Because Jesus, like, at the end of the day, like, he's majesty. He's God. And we have to remember, we are his dear friends. And he's coming. In fact, Jesus goes on. He says, guys, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. He's trying to comfort him but I'm going there to wake him. But the disciples are going, Lord, if he's falling asleep, he'll recover. There's sometimes that people in our life, right, like they don't get it, right? And like they just don't get it, and then they can be a distraction when they don't get it. 
right? And like, you're just trying to do what you do. And like, they're in your life saying, oh, Lord, it'll be fine. Oh, hey, person, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. But Jesus is on a mission. He says, the disciples answered, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. However, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was referring to natural sleep. So then Jesus tells them plainly, like a savage, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> Guys, wake up. And listen, this is frustrating. This is challenging. This is painful. For your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Let us go to him. That is so annoying. I mean, in my humanity, what? I thought you were always going to be there, God. I thought you'd never leave me or forsake you. I, you, I thought I married the one. I, I thought this was never going to happen. How could somebody cheat on me? How could somebody die? How could I lose this? How did I, I lose my property? God, I went to school, and now I've got so much school that I can't even see straight. How did you let this happen? And the pain is real. And Martha says this to Jesus, and I know somebody said this before. Jesus, Lord, if you'd been there, my brother would not have died. I'll say it again so you can see it. Lord, Jesus, if you would have been there, my brother would not have died. Have you ever said that to God? You're like, God, if you would have just been there, my marriage wouldn't have ended in divorce. God, if you would have just came through, my kids wouldn't have run down to Kensington and Somerset and lost their life. Lord, if you would have just been there, then this wouldn't have happened or that wouldn't have happened. Or Lord, if you would have just been there, then my parents would still be married. Or Lord, if you would have just been there, then mis the miscarriage wouldn't have happened. Lord, if you would have just been there. The Spirit of God, friends, is everywhere. But the answers of God sometimes take time. And the way that God reveals his majesty is not just in our trials, but he also reveals in time. And we don't like that. In our humanity, we hate that it takes time because I want it now. You guys remember this Popeye's fiasco that swept our nation? I'm still mad about this. Like, I never got a chicken sandwich. Anybody else out there? And I just kept saying to myself, I just wait it out. I just wait it out. And I thought I was like semi-famous, which I'm totally not, uh, just for clarity, but I thought I was for a second. I was walking to our Center City location before service, and, and there's a Popeyes by the jazz club. And, and somebody goes, yo, pastor. I'm like. <laughs> and he's like, you want a chicken sandwich? I was like, God, is this a trap? Like, I know I'm supposed to be faithful to Chick-fil-A. Like, I know that's your thing and all. But like, Lord, everybody's doing it. Like, I want this, I, I want this spicy, hot, good-looking chicken sandwich. But God was faithful. Because... This kid came to service that night. He said, would you believe when we got up to the line, they were all sold out. <laughs> In my heart, I was like, thank you, God. You're faithful. <laughs> You'll help me get out of every temptation. <laughs> You'll provide a way out of my temptation. But you know what Popeyes is going to do? They're going to bring that thing back in time. Because they know what they're doing. And they're strategic, right? Because, like, they sold out, and maybe it happened way beyond they thought, right? But, listen, listen. They're going to bring it back, and it's going to be the same craziness. And here's the spiritual implication here. Sometimes we don't get what we thought we should get when we should get it because there has to be a delay period. There has to be. Because if I got, listen to me, if we get all the time what we want right when we want it, we may, we may not steward it, we may not appreciate it, we may, may not fully understand it. There's something God wants to teach in the time in between. And I wonder what God's trying to teach you in the time in between. What is he teaching? What is he saying? See, God's timing is not our timing. 
In verse 21 of that same scripture, Martha declares death. She declares death. And is it possible that some of us have declared death over things before we need to? She says, Lazarus was dead. If you would have just been there, he would not have died. And sometimes we've got to stop saying things are dead when there's still potential for life. Because it's not over until God says it's over. And even when it's over, it ain't over. It's just God's time, not mine. See, some of you are calling things dead that God hasn't intended to be finished. There's a gal in our church, Marina, her father, she was on vacation in Las Vegas with her father. And she went to go get lunch. And while she was getting lunch, he dropped to the floor having a heart attack. And she said at 1.33, she texted all of the other leaders and she said, pray, my father has dropped, pray. At 1.51, they put him in the ambulance. They gave him three shocks. And he had no pulse, no brain activity, no pupil response, no movement. After three chest shocks. At 2.02, at the hospital, they still had nothing. At 2.05, they pulled her into a comfort room to tell her that her father was dead. He had been dead for 35 minutes. But at 2.06, there was a faint pulse. They said, they said, your dad will be a vegetable his whole life. He'll never regain consciousness even though he has a pulse. He's been dead for 35 minutes. But at 3.11, he woke up and he said, is that my favorite daughter? <laughs> and he said her name. And then two weeks later, he was back to work. But see, we want stuff to happen right now. But the way God does it, he does it in his time. The last I checked, the Bible says that his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. God, help me see it your way in your time. And here's the thing, listen. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You can be seated. I got more. You can be seated. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. She never said he was dead. She just kept on praying. I'm just going to keep believing because I know that my God is who he says he is. And Peter says this, he says, don't overlook the obvious here, friends. With God, one day is as good as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. And God, listen, he's not late with his promise of some measure lateness. We got to stop trying to make God our humanity when he is our majesty. He's restraining himself on account of you holding back at the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. He's giving everyone space and time to change. What are you doing with the time right now that you don't prefer to be in? It reminds me of when Jesus died on the cross and then he sat in the grave. And that day for the disciples, the time in between was probably full of anxiousness and fear and wonder, but a Sunday is coming. Jesus said he was on his way. And what I want to tell you today that it might take some time, but Jesus is on his way. He says it to the disciples. He says it to Martha. Lady, I'm on the way. Like, I've got this worked out. Like, I'm God. Like, I know what I'm doing. I know you've seen me heal some things. And what I'm here to tell you today is some stuff hasn't gone right. And you may not be happy with how your life turned out. You might wonder if God is real. You might be wondering if things are dead. But I'm telling you today, Jesus is on the way. That's good news. He's on the way. You just got to open up your heart, your senses, your mind, your spirit to him. See, what's viewed as a mess to our humanity is a calm miracle for his majesty. I'm grateful. I don't know there's some people who've seen some miracles in their lives, and it probably didn't happen when they wanted it or the way they wanted it, but it happened how it needed to happen. And then Jesus tells her, listen, he tells her, just listen, your brother will rise from the dead. And Martha replied, I know that he'll rise from the dead in the resurrection on the last day. She goes and she makes an excuse for God. Because I do believe that God sometimes heals in life and then sometimes he heals in eternity. And she's thinking, okay, he'll raise in the last day. Thanks for that little bit of hope. But Jesus is going, I, I am the resurrection and I'm the life. Which means I'm the God of your eternity and I'm also the God of your abundant life right now. Whoever believes in me and everyone who lives 
and believes in me, that's the key word, stay with me, will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And the question for you today is, do you believe this? Like maybe you have some faint hope at some point I'll get right with God. At some point I'll follow him. Maybe when I'm old, I'll read my Bible or, or, or at some point in my life, I'll, I'll go to church again. I'm just kind of here because somebody invited me. But what I'm telling you is now is the time. He is the resurrection, which means, yes, there's an eternity that you will face, whether with God or separated from God, and he's willing to give you eternity in heaven. However, there's also a life you get to live of purpose and of abundance. And he's saying, now, Martha, he's dead, but I'm here, so it ain't over till it's over. And God's majesty is revealed in trials, it's revealed in time, but it's also revealed in trust. We have to trust him. We have to believe. And guess what? Even if you got a little bit of a mustard seed, just a small bit of faith, God can do something. I'm telling you, God's up to something. And I'm almost done. But I just think this part is so powerful because Martha sees Jesus in the wrong way in this moment. She knows he has the power to heal over sickness and over life, but she doesn't realize he has the power over death as well. And it's important for you to understand that sometimes God allows some things to die so that new things can live. And it's possible that God allowed a relationship to die, a situation to die, a scenario to die, a person to go. Sometimes God allows some things to leave your life because there's something new he wants to impart through your life. It's possible that God is using the weak and the pain and the struggle and the hurt. He's saying, I want to do something great. And sometimes certain things have to die. Ideologies have to die. Ways of living have to die. Ways that used to work that don't work anymore. It's got to go because I've got something new to give you. Now, I want to contradict myself for a moment. And you're like, oh, here goes the preacher contradicting himself. But stay with me because I'm literally done. I have a couple minutes. Stay with me. Nobody move me. I know, I know I said that God, he reveals his majesty to us in trials and in time, okay? But what if the in time is you right now? Like, like what if somebody has been praying for you for 20 years and your in time is right now? Like, what if somebody has been fasting for you all month so that you'd come to the Fillmore and you're in time in the balcony? It's right now. Like, what if somebody's been praying for you and fasting for you and seeking God for you and that healing that you're desiring? What if it's right now? Like, I just believe that God is the God of the in time, but your in time could be right now in this moment. I'm saying that God might in this moment heal somebody of depression or maybe heal somebody of a disease. I'm I'm saying right now God might heal somebody of a broken marriage that he wants to put back together. I'm saying that you're in time could be right now because the last I read, he's the resurrection and he's the life. And so I believe marriages can be healed today and restored. I believe that dreams can be restored. I believe you're going to feel again. I believe you're going to dream again. I believe you're going to hope again. I believe you're going to run again. I believe God's about to do something in somebody because you're in time. It's right now. Do I have anybody who believes that God might use this moment? That some things in me are dead. Some things in me are broken. Some things are being shambles. But I've got a God of right now. Right now. Listen, Jesus isn't here to heal your sickness. He's here to resurrect every dead place in your life. It's not just for your sickness, like, like you're, you're going to live again. You're going to breathe again. You're going to see again. You're going to sing again. You're going to believe again. And maybe somebody for the first time. Now I'm done because I got a football game to watch. But I need, to, I need to share this part. Stay with me. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time, it's going to be an offensive odor. Like he's been dead for four days. Thank you, Martha, for continuing to tell me how to run the world. <laughs> hey, stop telling God how to run the world. Remember what I told you. God is attracted. His majesty is attracted to our broken humanity. 
So God's looking for some smelly people. And I'm not talking about millennials who don't wear deodorant. I'm talking about people who got some sin in their life, some stuff that don't look right. People who only came today because you think that if you went and donned the door of a church, it burned down or it stinks so bad. That's who God's coming for. That's who God's looking for. He's not worried about some stink. He's not worried about some sin. He put all that on his back on the cross. He's looking for a grave. He's looking for somebody to resurrect. He's looking for a life to change. If you stink, then you're a candidate for his love. See, God's not afraid of that smell, of your humanity, of your mess. You want to go to that grave. And Martha goes, it's hopeless. How long do we got to do this? How long are we going to tell God it's hopeless? End that speech today. She says, did I not say to you that if you believe in me, you'll see the glory of God, the expression of his excellence? So they listened to him finally. What would happen if over the next five years we would just obey now instead of obeying later? What would God do through us? So they go and they roll away the stone and he says this. He says, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. And listen to me, but I've said this because of the people standing around. Any parents say prayers with their kids, but they're really talking to their kids while they pray? My wife does that all the time. Drives me crazy. Lord, please help my husband um, uh, do the dishes and the laundry on time, God. And please help him make the bed and please help him put my kid. You know what I'm saying? And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's like wake these people up. I'm doing this for them. And God's about to resurrect somebody and it's not just going to be for you, it's going to be for somebody else. So that you may believe that you've sent me. You made me a representative. And then he says this, he goes, okay, here we go. Lazarus, come forth. And I brought my own Lazarus today because this is Xavier and I wanted to make fun of him. And I wanted this moment forever to embarrass him and make fun of him. But also, I wanted to illustrate something. Out came the man who had been dead, his heads and feet tightly wrapped in burial clothes. So if he comes out like this, it's a little bit creepy, right? I mean, some of you are going to give your life to Jesus, and it's going to freak some people out in your life because you're not going to know what you're doing or what you're saying. You're going to look a little bit like this. But here's what happens, it's so beautiful. God is brilliant and it's why we need the church. It's why we're celebrating five years together so that the church will be even greater and bigger. And maybe at year five, we'll be at Lincoln Financial Fields or year 10 instead of in here. Because here's what happens. Okay, Jesus says, okay, next slide, Jesus. He says to them, he says, unwrap them. He says to the church, he says, unwrap them. It's Jesus who saves you. It's Jesus who redeems you. It's Jesus who heals you. But it is the church. It is your community. It is your people who unwrap you. It is your community. You come out. God takes you out of the grave. But it's your community who gets you out of the grave clothes. And see, God wants to restore every sense that's been lost or broken. So he'll start with your hands. And he'll say to your community, unwrap those hands. He'll say, I died on the cross and they pierced my hands so that there would be a transformation, a transition. There would be a transfer so that my hands would be your hands. So that you'd stop touching what you used to touch and going where you used to go. And that your hands would have some power to heal just like mine. And our community helps us know that then he says to him I wanted him to have new vision so unwrap his eyes like we want to see differently and your community will help you see the world differently see I met Jesus and I was lost but it was some people to help me know I still got some blind spots I was once blind but now I see but I got some blind spots but my people held me up my people taught me how to live to hear differently because all I've been listening to is stuff and lies. I've been calling things dead that are not dead yet. But I've got some community in my life going, it's not over. God did it for me. He raised my father from the dead. He healed my mother of cancer. You're going to make it. You're going to get through this. God always uses people. Some of you, you've been speaking death your whole life. Your whole life, you've been calling things death and you've been so afraid and you're just speaking speaking stuff that gets in your brain and God wants to put something new in your mouth. In fact, the scriptures say he's going to put a new song in your mouth. Come on, unwrap that mouth. 
And now we've got all of our senses intact. His nose, he's going to begin to breathe again. Some of you need to stop breathing in fear and start breathing out faith. You're not, you don't have to say it's my depression. What we're going to do is we're going to give that to him with all of our heart. And when I get weak, my friends are going to hold me up. When I'm afraid, when I'm not strong, it's not my anxiety. It's a battle that I'm facing that I'm going to give to God, right? It's not my sickness. It's my community's sickness. It's everybody's. I'm in this together. Come on, Block Church. It's going to take all of us to revive our city.